Welcome to the Cisco Netacad Introduction to Networks video series by Jason Johnson. This video covers Module 7, Ethernet Switching. The module objectives for Module 7 are Ethernet Frame, Ethernet MAC Address. We'll be talking about that. We will also be going over the MAC Address at table and switch speeds and forwarding methods. Ethernet Frames. When we talk about Ethernet frames, the first thing we're going to talk about is Ethernet encapsulation. Ethernet operates in the data link layer and the physical layer. It's a family of networking technologies defined in the IEEE 802.2 and 802.3 standards. And as I've suggested in previous modules, and if you have me in class as a student, you will know I recommend that you go out and research those standards. And also, you need to know which one of the standards, the 8022, the 8023, the 8025, um, the 11, all, all of those you need to memorize um, and know what those are. So now we're talking about layer one and layer two. So we're talking about the OSI model. Layer one and layer two here, we have the physical layer, layer one, and layer two, our data link layer. 8023 governs the physical layer and part of the data link layer, which is the MAC, and the 8022 governs the LLC. Now, when we talk about the data link sublayers, the 802 LAN MAN standards, including Ethernet, use two separate sublayers of the data link layer to operate. The LLC sublayer, that's governed by the IEEE 802.2. It places information in the frame to identify which network layer protocol is used for the frame. And the MAC sublayer, that's IEEE 802.3, 802.11, or 802.15. And those are responsible for data encapsulation and media access control, not MAC. MAC is a MAC address, but media access control and provides data link layer addressing. Let's take a closer look at this here. So this is the sublayers. We have our data link, we have our LLC sublayer, MAC sublayer. This one's governed by the 8022. And then we have our Ethernet, the WLAN, and the WPAN, for the, and which, which standard it's governed by. Now, the MAC sublayer is responsible for data encapsulation and accessing the media. Data encapsulation is 802.3. It includes the following, the Ethernet frame, Ethernet addressing, and Ethernet error detection. So the Ethernet frame, this is the internal structure of the Ethernet frame. The addressing is the frame. That part of the frame includes both the source and destination MAC address. So you need to know where it's coming from. You need to know where it's going to, and that's what this includes. It's to deliver the Ethernet frame from the Ethernet NIC to the Ethernet NIC on the same LAN. And that's important to remember on this. You need to know that. When we're talking about the MAC and the sublayer, and we're talking about layer two, it's on the same local area network. It does not get routed. Routing takes place at layer three. Ethernet error detection, that's the frame that includes a frame check sequence or FCS trailer used for error detection. You may see a question somewhere along the lines. I know I've seen questions about the FCS, but that's the frame check sequence, if you see that, and that's just used for error detection. The media access, that's 802.3. It's the MAC sublayer includes the specifications for different Ethernet communication standards over various types of media, including copper and fiber. Legacy Ethernet uh, using a bus topology or hubs is a shared half duplex medium. And Ethernet over a half duplex medium uses a contention-based access method. We've covered that. We've talked about that in previous modules. Carrier sense multiple access collision detection. That's always difficult to say. CSMA CD and CSMA CR. Yeah, the the that carrier sense multiple detect multiple access collision detection. And Ethernet lines of today use switches that operate in full duplex. Full duplex communications with Ethernet switches do not require access control through CSMACD. Okay, this is another look at the uh, MAC sublayer here with the uh, fast Ethernet, gigabit Ethernet over fiber, Ethernet over copper, 10 gig Ethernet over fiber, and then the, the rest of the standards that are there. Ethernet frame fields. The minimum Ethernet frame field is 64 bytes, and the maximum is 1,518 bytes. The preamble field is not included when describing the size of the frame. Any frame less than 64 bytes in length is considered a collision fragment or a, what the, a runt frame is another word for it. Uh, but it's basically, it's going to be discarded. It's saying, you know, we don't know what to do with this. It's not 64 bit, uh, bytes and we're done. We're not, we're not even dealing with it. And so they just toss, it, just, it gets tossed. Frames with more than 1,500 bytes of data are considered jumbo or baby giant frames. And if the size of the transmitted frame is less than the minimum or greater than the maximum, the receiving device just drops it. 
It gets it. We're done with it. It's not doing anything with it. It just it drops it. And when I say drop it, it just doesn't do anything with it. Drop frames are likely to be the result of collisions or unwanted signals. So you get interference on your lines, and that uh, could be the cause of that. So they're considered invalid. And jumbo frames are usually supported by most fast Ethernet or gigabit Ethernet switches and NICs. And this is a visual representation here. We have your preamble, and then you have your destination. You need to know where it's coming or going to, your source, where it's coming from, the type and length, which is two bytes. And then all your data, that can be anywhere from 45 to 1500 bytes. And then your FCS, your error checking. Ethernet MAC address. An Ethernet MAC address consists of a 48-bit binary value. It's expressed using 12 hexadecimal values. So given that 8 bits is one byte, is a common binary grouping. So binary 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0, 0 to 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1 can be represented in hexadecimal as the range of 0, 0 to FF. So see, you can take this binary number and break it down into just two digits. So now you're only sending two digits um, across instead of all of these, you know, it's, it's just easier to read and, it, and it's uh, less processing to use smaller numbers. So when using hexadecimal, leading zeros are always displayed to complete the 8-bit representation. For example, a binary value of 0000, 0, 0, 0. 1010 is represented in hexadecimal as 0A. You don't just say A. It's got to be 0A. So you need to fill out the full length of it. Hexadecimal numbers are often represented by the value preceded by 0x, so 0x73. That's to distinguish between decimal and hexadecimal values in documentation. So if you see a 0x73, you know that that's what they're doing there. That's, that's to tell the difference. Hexadecimal may, be also, hexadecimal may also be response, represented by a subscript 16 or the hex number followed by an h, or 73h. You might see it written that way as well. In an Ethernet LAN, every network device is connected to the same shared media. MAC addressing provides a method for device identification at the data link layer of the OSI model. This is not routing. This is at the layer 2. An Ethernet MAC address is a 48-bit address expressed using 12 hexadecimal digits. Because a byte equals 8 bits, we can also say that a MAC address is 6 bytes in length. So all MAC addresses must be unique to the Ethernet device or Ethernet interface. To ensure this, all vendors that sell Ethernet devices must register with the IEEE to obtain a unique six hexadecimal code called the Organizational Unique Identifier. You might see that at some point somewhere. Organizational Unique Identifier, OUI. An Ethernet MAC address also consists of a six hexadecimal vendor OUI code followed by a six hexadecimal vendor assigned value. So this first part is the OUI. That's going to be assigned by the IEEE to whoever's manufacturing NICs. And then the last part is going to be assigned by the vendor themselves. You can take your hexadecimal number and put in search for it on the internet and you can find out who manufactured the, that network interface card. Now, it may not be the exact person that you purchased it from or has their name on the card because it's the actual manufacturer of the card and who assigned the MAC address. And a quick note about security, MAC addresses can be spoofed on networks. So that's not 100% secure wise because you can override the MAC address and, and spoof those with software, just as a note. Now, when we're talking about frame processing, when a device is forwarded, when a device is forwarding a message to an Ethernet network, the Ethernet header includes a source MAC address and a destination MAC address. So when the NIC receives an Ethernet frame, it examines the destination MAC to see if it matches the physical MAC address that's stored in RAM. If there's no match, the device discards the frame. If there is a match, it passes the frame up the OSI layers where the de-encapsulation process takes place. So Ethernet NICs will also accept frames if the destination MAC is a broadcast or multicast group of which the host is a member. And we'll take a look at those here in just a second. Any device that is a source or destination of an Ethernet frame will have an Ethernet NIC and therefore a MAC address. And that includes workstations, servers, printers, mobile devices, routers. And this is an example here. So you have your destination, your source, and your data. And it will just say, this is not addressed to me. So this is getting sent. And H2 says, it's not mine, discards it. H3 says, hey, that's mine. It starts receiving it. All the other ones, they just ignore it because it's not addressed to them. The unicast MAC address. An Ethernet 
Uh, different MAC addresses are used for Layer 2 unicast broadcast and multicast communications. A unique MAC address is, is the unique address that is used when a frame is sent from a single transmitting device to a single destination device. And we'll look at a blow-up model of this here in a second. The process that a source host uses to determine the destination MAC address associated with the V4 address is known as Address Resolution Protocol. You need to know that protocol, Address Resolution Protocol, or ARP. Another word for it, what you'll, hear, you'll hear people refer to that as ARP, or an ARP request, but that's the ARP, the Address Resolution Protocol. The process that a source host uses to determine the destination MAC address associated with a V6 address is known as the dis neighborhood or neighbor discovery. I sometimes call it the neighborhood discovery. Neighbor discovery or ND. And you need to be aware of that as well. That's the V6. So V4 is ARP. V6 is ND or neighborhood. Neighbor, I keep saying neighborhood. Neighbor discovery. And the source MAC address must always be a unicast. The source MAC address, it's always got to be a unicast. Let's take a look at this uh, visually here. So the source host here at H1 needs to send this frame to the server. It sends it over to the switch. The switch says, hey, you know, it, it broadcasts it on, or it sends it on out. It's not broadcast. Uh, this is a unicast. But these other devices see it. They can see your traffic, but they drop it because it's not addressed to them. And the MAC address here says, oh, yeah, this comes to me. It receives it, and it starts pulling that information in, and then it forwards the frames back or the information back and that's a unicast a broadcast is an ethernet broadcast frame um, it's processed by every device on the ethernet lan the features of an ethernet broadcast are as follows it has the destination mac address of ff 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 in hexadecimal 48 ones so it's all ones it's flooded out all ethernet ports except the incoming port and it's not forwarded by a router so routers see those and just drop them if the encapsulated data is a V4 broadcast packet, this means that the packet contains a destination V4 address that has all ones in the host portion. And this numbering in the address means that all hosts on that local network broadcast domain will receive and process the packet. So just here, if it's sending out a broadcast packet, it goes to everyone. Unicast goes to one. Broadcast goes to everybody. And then we come to the multicast. This is a destination MAC address, uh, or there's a destination MAC address of 01005E when the encapsulated data is a V4 multicast packet and a destination MAC address is 3333 when the encapsulated data is a V6 multicast packet. So there are other reserved multicast destination MAC addresses, um, such as Spanning Tree Protocol or STP. It's flooded out to all Ethernet switch ports except the incoming port unless the switch is configured for multicast snooping. It's not forwarded by a router, unless the router is configured to route multicast packets. And because multicast addresses represent a group of addresses, sometimes called a host group, they can only be used as the destination of a packet. The source will always be a unicast, and as with the unicast and broadcast addresses, the multicast IP address requires a corresponding multicast MAC address. That's a lot to say. So let's just look at it from a visual standpoint. A multicast is this source host says they need to send it out to multiple units. So it sends it out and the ones that it's designed for or destined for will receive it. The others drop it. So unicast goes to one, broadcast goes to everybody, and multicast goes to many but not all. Because if it went to all, it would be a broadcast. The MAC address table. So a Layer 2 Ethernet switch uses Layer 2 MAC addresses to make forwarding decisions. It's completely unaware of the data protocol being carried in the data portion of the frame, such as an IVP, IPv4 ad packet or an ARP message or a V6 ND packet. The switch makes its forwarding decisions based solely on the Layer 2 Ethernet MAC address. So it doesn't do any routing, doesn't even look at the IP addressing. An Ethernet switch examines its MAC address table to make a forwarding decision for each frame, unlike legacy Ethernet hubs that repeat bits at all ports except the incoming port. And when a switch is turned on, the MAC address table is empty. And the MAC address table is sometimes referred to as the content addressable memory table or CAM table. I don't see that too often in networking, but that is, a, that is um, what it's sometimes referred to. Now, when you examine the source MAC address, Every frame that enters a switch is checked for new information to learn. It does this by examining the source MAC address of the frame and the port number 
where that frame entered the switch. If the source MAC address does not exist, it's added to the table along with the incoming port number. So it builds a table. If the source MAC address does not ex does exist, the switch updates the refresh timer for that entry. So by default, most Ethernet switches keep an entry in the table for five minutes. If the source MAC address does, does exist on the table, but on a different port, the switch treats this as a new entry and the entry is replaced using the same MAC address, but with the more current port number. And if the destination MAC address is a unicast address, the switch will look for a match between the destination MAC of the frame and an entry in its MAC address table. And if the MAC destination MAC address is in the table, it will forward the frame out the specified port. So if the destination MAC address is not in the table, the switch will forward the frame out all ports except the incoming port, and that's called as an unknown unicast. Unknown unicast. And a note here is if the destination MAC address is a broadcast or a multicast, the frame is also flooded out all ports except the incoming port. On filtering frames, as a switch receives frames from different devices, it's able to populate its MAC address table by examining the source MAC of every frame. When the MAC address table of the switch contains the destination MAC address, it's able to filter the frame and forward out a single port. So it can do some filtering. So switches are a little bit smarter than hubs. So in, in, in the most likelihood, you're not going to come across hubs. Just as a quick note here, you're most likely not going to come across hubs in your everyday working networking experience. If you're working with some older legacy equipment, you may have some, but it's just my advice. This is my personal advice is if you've got hubs in a networking environment, get them replaced. If, if you need if you need a hub, do, do an evaluation and get those replaced with some better equipment. Switch speeds and forwarding methods. So switches use one of the following forwarding methods for switching data between network ports. The first one is stored and forward switching. This frame forwarding method receives the entire frame and computes the CRC. If the CRC is valid, the switch looks up the destination address, which determines the outgoing interface, and then the frame is forwarded out the correct port. And then you have cut through switching. This frame forwarding method forwards the frame before it is entirely received. At a minimum, the destination address of the frame must be read before the frame can be forwarded. And a big advantage of store and forward switching is that it determines if a frame has errors before propagating the frame. And when an error is detected in a frame, the switch discards that frame. Discarding frames with, er with errors reduces the amount of bandwidth consumed by the corrupt data. Store and forward switching is required for quality of service analysis on converged networks where frame classification for traffic pri prioritization, prioritization is necessary. For example, voice over IP, data streams need to have priority over web browsing traffic. In cut through switching, the switch acts upon the data as soon as it's received, even if the transmission is not complete. The switch buffers just enough of the frame to read the destination MAC address so that it can determine which port it should send it out. And then the switch does not perform any error checking, it just goes. And there's two variants, fast forward switching, that offers the lowest level of latency, by immediately forwarding a packet after reading the destination address. And because fast forwarding switching starts forwarding before the entire packet's been received, there may be times when packets are relayed with errors. So the destination NIC discards the faulty packet upon receipt and fast forward switching is the typical cut through method of switching. And then you have fragment free switching. That's a compromise between the high latency and high integrity of store and forward switching and the low latency and reduced integrity of fast forward switching. The switch stores and performs an error check on the first 64 bytes of the frame before forwarding. And because most network errors and collisions occur during the first 64 bytes, this ensures that a collision has not occurred before forwarding the frame. So less bandwidth on this one. Now memory buffering on switches. An ethernet switch may use a buffering technique to store frames before forwarding them or when the destination port is busy because of congestion. And so port-based memory, frames are stored in queues that are linked to specific incoming and outgoing ports. A frame's transmitted to the outgoing port only when all the frames ahead in the queue have been successfully transmitted. And it is possible for a frame or a single frame to delay the transmission of all the frames in memory because of a busy destination port. And finally, the delay occurs even if the other frames can be transmitted to open destination ports. 
And then we have shared memory. That deposits all frames into a common memory buffered shared by all switch ports. And the amount of buffer memory required by a port is dynamically allocated. And the frames in the buffer are dynamically linked to a destination port, enabling a packet to be received on one port and then transmitted on another port without moving it to a different queue. So shared memory buffering also results in larger frames that can be transmitted with fewer drop frames. And it's important with asymmetric switching, which allows for different data rates on different ports. Therefore, more bandwidth can be dedicated to certain ports, such as a server port. Two of the most basic settings on a switch are the bandwidth speed and the duplex settings for each individual switch port. It's critical that the duplex and bandwidth settings match between the switch port and the connected devices. So there's two types of duplex settings used for communications on an Ethernet network, full duplex and half duplex. Full duplex, both ends of the connection can send and receive simultaneously. And half duplex, only one end of the connection can be sent at a time. Now, auto negotiation is an optional function found on most Ethernet switches and NICs. It enables two devices to automatically negotiate the best speed and duplex capabilities. And a note here about gigabit Ethernet ports only operate in full duplex. Now, duplex mismatch is one of the most common causes of performance issues on a 10100 megabyte Ethernet link. It occurs when one port on the link operates at half duplex while the other port operates at full duplex. And that can occur when one or both ports on a link are reset and the auto negotiation process does not result in both link partners having the same configuration. It can also occur when users reconfigure one side of the link and forget to reconfigure the other side. So human error. And both sides of a link should have auto negotiation on or both sides should have it off. So best practice is to configure both Ethernet switch ports as full duplex. So you, you do get collision there and you got to be careful about that. Now, auto MDIX, MDIX, the connections between devices once required the use of either a crossover or straight through cable. The type of cable required, the, the type of cable required depended on the type of interconnecting devices. So a direct connection between a router and a host requires a crossover connection, as a note there. Now, most switch devices in modern days now support the automatic medium dependent interface crossover or auto MDIX feature. When enabled, the switch automatically detects the type of cable attached to the port and configures the interfaces accordingly. The auto MDIX feature is enabled by default on switches running Cisco iOS release 12 or later. And however, the feature could be disabled. And so for this reason, you should always correct cable type, use the correct cable type and not rely on the auto MDIX feature. You always should have correct cabling anyway, no matter what. Always have correct cabling. But just in case you get a cable that's configured wrong, the auto MDEX should fix it for you. An auto MDEX can be re-enabled using the MDEX auto integrate interface configuration command on your router or switch. This has been module seven of the V7 introduction to networks by the Cisco Networking Academy. I hope it was helpful for you and hope you have a great day.